Hello, my name is Peaches Golding, and this is my journey to justice. Theophilus Hauser in 1853 bought my great-great-grandmother, Bethania, as a young girl, and she became one of his slaves. And at that time, I think he did a transaction of maybe 13 or 14 or 15 slaves he bought at the same time that uh, he bought her. She grew up in the house of the plantation homestead, and her role was as housekeeper. So she was an educated uh, woman. He did educate her. And um, together they had three children. And um, the oldest was Alexander. And one of his children is my grandfather. And the second child is Martin. And one of his children is my grandmother. Well, my father was a very interesting man. He um, followed his heart and followed his interests, and lots of things caught his attention. During World War II, he signed up in the Army, and he took part in the D-Day landings. Many of his uh, siblings also fought for the U.S. In, in, in World War II. He tried unsuccessfully to become an officer. Um, he was able to pass the test on three occasions, but on all three occasions, um, he was denied that opportunity. Uh, but nonetheless, what was good about uh, being a GI was that the GI Bill enabled veterans to go and get university qualifications. So my father went on to get his doctorate degrees as a result of that bill. Dad was not defined by race or confined by race. However, he did run into a, a spot of bother, I think in about 1947, this is a couple of years after the war. He was working in one state, my mother was working at a, in another state at that time and he wanted to go and see her. And the only way to get there was on a bus. And he, he took that bus and he sat where he wanted to sit, which was in the front of the bus. And he was challenged by everyone on that bus to, to, to move and he refused to so do. And um, when the bus pulled into the depot and very horrid things were said and done, um, my father was able to file a lawsuit. And he was also able to successfully defend that lawsuit. The bus company had to pay him 2,000 US dollars, which was a lot of money in 1947 because um, he could sit anywhere he wanted to because it was a bus that was traveling from one state to another and consequently that law which said you have to sit in the back of the bus did not apply. So dad was the second person in the U.S. to do that, to challenge that law. Third person, Rosa Parks, is very, very well known because there was a lot of steam behind um, challenging the law and publicizing it and um, that's why we know Rosa Parks really quite so well. My parents decided when I was in year six that um, I, as, as well as a number of other um, black children, would go to a previously white primary school. So in 1965, we became the first little black children, probably anywhere in the state, to go to what was previously a white school. So um, we found that as young children, we were just as capable um, of studying and performing well, um, excelling in our classes um, along with others. So um, we felt just as able, just as capable as anyone else. It wasn't the same for all little black children, I must say. I ran for um, a student body office um, I wanted to be president of the student council. Actually, I didn't. I ran to be vice president of the student council. Um, it was one election. But I also um, used to dance, and we used to have um, a group of cheerleaders, yes, but a group of other ones called Dancing Boots. And we would perform at uh, football and basketball games and all sorts of things like that. And I remembered winning the election 
But I also remember being told that I couldn't hold two senior positions um, at secondary school. And I questioned it and I said, well, why is that? Because the year before, um, one of the cheerleaders had had a major role and also been in the uh, student council. But I was unsuccessful with that one. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. You get knocked down seven times, you get up eight times. I came to live in Bristol in the early 1980s. We lived in Hinley's. There weren't very many black people there at all. And um, I generally didn't find devilment um, in, in the sense that people didn't know who I was or, or, or that they didn't accept me or anything like that. I've always felt very much accepted in Britain. It's one, I had a very middle class upbringing. Uh, two, my accent foxed people. As an American, they couldn't pigeonhole me in any particular um, way or, or other. So I was always able to get the jobs that I applied for and um, was very successful in, in, in doing that. I do know, however, that's not the same experience that everyone has um, when they first come to a country or even in, in Britain in the 1980s. What I can say is that the city is far more relaxed now, far more open to people of different cultures and backgrounds and the diversity of attitude. It's changed quite a lot. And I think Bristol now has built upon all of those differences to make a harmonious and a creative and an innovative um, and an energetic city. So I think all of those um, the, the, the differences um, have come together in a very positive way here. And I think that, that Bristol, um, and actually the UK, um, does race issues really quite well. I've um, had the pleasure of, of being on the board of, of businesses and organizations in healthcare, in education, in um, the media, and eventually I, I became um, the High Sheriff of Bristol, and that is the junior appointment of, of the Queen. And that role is to, um, I guess, ensure justice in, in, in the widest possible sense. Recently, I've achieved the Queen's more senior appointment. So I am now the Lord Lieutenant of the County and City of Bristol. And that role is a role that lasts till my 75th birthday. And that role is responsible for royal visits to the city, liaison with the military, for um, various honors, and just ensuring that there is good harmony and a good atmosphere in the city. So what we have an opportunity to do is to build on the many, many, many things that we in Bristol already do well, spread that and do things better in all parts of the city. It's not expensive. It's a matter of encouraging people. It's a matter of breaking into little chunks what is privilege and how you replicate that. And if we get those types of, of building blocks right, we will have a more just, a more equal, a better, an innovative, a sustainable society.